I had a thought while David was speaking. Karin, I want you to remember this. When I meet my ultimate reward, invite David to the funeral. <laughs> uh, this is really a pleasure and an honor to be here today. Uh, and it's hard to be unemotional about today. There are so many of my friends here, uh, and I have deep ties into this community, having served in various positions at MCI, which was the, uh, at the fountainhead of many of the changes that you see from a technology point of view here in the, in the worldwide. Uh, my friends from Nextel, we had a mini American Express board meeting with Ted Leonsis and Vernon Jordan earlier. Steve Case and Gene Case from AOL and all the folks from AOL. I was on the board at AOL, Time Warner, for many years. And of course, the Carlisle Group, which is, which is great, and my personal friends. Two of the gentlemen I know for 20 years, I play squash with routinely, and I might add, routinely beat. <laughs> and of course, uh, my college roommates here, uh, Jim Perry, who uh, is a dear friend of he knew me when I had hair, and, uh, which even my wife can't say. Um, and Jim and I roomed together for three and a half years at the United States Naval Academy. And of course, my wife, who I um, couldn't have <clears throat> embarked on this um, adventure without her. How many veterans are there in the group? Would you raise your hands? Thank you for your service. And thank you, David, for the kind introduction. It's great to be here. I flew in last night, and yes, I did fly commercial. <laughs> I'm not that dumb. Uh, I did the whole airport thing. <clears throat> I actually chose the enhanced pat down of the entire body. <laughs> and I told the TS agent, take your best shot, big guy. I've been through it. The road show was an experience on many different levels, but it was worth it. Um, 18 months ago, GM was pretty much flat on its back. In June of 2009, we filed for bankruptcy protection. That's kind of old news now, but if you would just think about it for a moment. General Motors, the icon of American manufacturing, one time the holder 50% of the U.S. vehicle market, standard bearer, bearer, bearer of what was termed the modern corporation, and it went bankrupt. It was unimaginable until it actually happened. 39 days, 39 days later, thanks to help from the U.S. taxpayer and others, GM was relaunched. Critics gave us very little chance of success. Many thought we would remain in, on the public dole for decades. Others simply left us for dead. But 16 months later, after emerging from bankruptcy, this new GM was relaunched in one of the most, if not the most successful, initial public offering ever. I spent many decades in business, most recently in private equity. It was my job in a sense, to assess companies, their jobs, their prospects, their managements, and essentially make bets on their futures. I can promise you that two years ago, there was precious few in this country that gave GM a chance or were willing to bet on its future. But three weeks ago, people by the hundreds of thousands did just that. They bet on General Motors. They saw a company with a new business model focused on solely three things, designing, building, and selling the world's best vehicles. They saw a new company with a competitive cost structure, improved capacity utilization, leaner inventories, improved brand equity, and customers willing to pay higher prices for great vehicles, all of which 
result in improved earnings and great cash flow. They saw an automotive company competing in a growth business. Hard to imagine not too many years ago. One that was better positioned than any other company in the world in the emerging markets of India, China, and Brazil. They saw a new company with a strong balance sheet and plans to make it even stronger. They saw a new company positioned to break even at the bottom of the market. Actually, 09 was a 50-year low for the automotive industry in this country, in this region, and we actually made money. Heretofore, the company would break even at mid-cycle, and they would only make money at the high end of the cycle. If we achieve a mid-cycle correction in the next year, GM is very well positioned to move forward. The new investors saw a company being managed by a mix of new talent that was intent on change and a team of highly skilled insiders who are running key operations around the world. And most importantly, they saw great new products in the marketplace, like the Cadillac SRX, which took nine market share points in one year. Buick LaCrosse. Buick is the fastest selling brand in America in the past 12 months. The GM Terrain and the Chevy Cruze, which is in 80 countries now, we introduced it here. It's either number one or two in each of the countries that it uh, is currently manufactured in and is the first really strong eco subcompact compact that uh, we've produced in this country. They also saw a company that today with four brands is selling more than it did a year ago with eight brands. And finally, they saw a lot of people beginning to believe in the new GM, a company that has learned from its past and is committed and determined not to make the mistakes of the past. At GM, we're building a culture that values speed, agility, and competitiveness, and that continually and will continually adapt its business model to the rapidly changing world and that puts the customer first. This may not seem revolutionary to you, but trust me, it is. <laughs> what does this mean? It means that we're working hard to set the pace with new cars like the Chevy Cruze. The Cruze was recently named 2001 Urban Car of the Year by Decisive Media. It's in a segment, it's a segment leader. It features things that we're gonna to start to differentiate on. 10 airbags, its competition has uh, eight. We have OnStar, we intend to make OnStar and every car on the road essentially a network node. Uh, you'll see dramatic changes in uh, the um, internet application to automotive and automotive safety. It means we're bringing customers the newest design and technology like Volt, the extended range electric vehicle. Volt is like no other car on the road today, none. It's an, by the way, there'll be four of them upstairs for you all to see. And anyone who would like to drive, it's only $25 for a trip around the block. We're trying to raise more revenue at every opportunity. <laughs> this, will, this car will go 50 miles on a single charge and then it converts to a, uh, a generator, an 86 horsepower gen, uh, uh, combustion engine, and it'll go another 300 miles. You can literally drive this car from Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles. Uh, not to say that we won't develop other cars like the <coughs> Leaf. <laughs> the, those are battery electric cars. We think they have a place in the marketplace, but we think they'll be more of a metro car. Yes, Steve, we'll sell them to the zip uh, if you would like to have some. From the start, the Volt was designed to change the way that we think about the automobile, and I think we've made a strong statement in that area. Just in 2011, the accolades have been many and wide. Uh, Car of the Year Award by Automobile Magazine, 
motor trend. I might also note we were also named to have the truck of the year. It's very rare for an automotive company to have both car and truck of the year by motor trend. The Volt was also named car of the year by Green Car Journal, as well as top honors from car and driver and popular mechanics. We're confident that the Volt will be one of the most important cars that GM's ever produced. In fact, when I think back over many people's lives in this room, the iconic car might have been described as the 64-65 Mustang. I think in 2020 and 2030, I hope my children will reflect back that the Volt was the iconic car of their generation. You might also, I might also note that one of the launch car, launch markets for the Volt will be Washington, D.C. There are seven. We intend to start shipping Volts next week for commercial uh, purchases. The Volt also is a statement that we are thinking globally as well as acting in what we believe to be society's best interest. Last month, we announced that Chevrolet will invest $40 million over the next few years for various clean energy projects throughout America. Why $40 million? These projects are designed to reduce about 8 million metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions in the United States. That's roughly the carbon print imprint or footprint emitted from all Chevrolets that will be sold between now and the end of 11. And we wanted to make a strong statement <clears throat> that we're just not out for a fast buck or to sell cars, but we want to be a responsible member of our society. This is a big and important goal and one we're committed to achieve. We think it's the right thing to do for our customers, our company, and for the communities that we live in. It's all part of GM's commitment to the environment and to a clean energy future. To be fair, and I appreciate all your kind words, David, this is not the result of me. I'm a member of the team. Many of these projects were started well before the bankruptcy, and I think we have to give due credit and gratitude to the people that had the foresight at General Motors to develop these great cars and trucks that are now winning so many awards. And I think it is testimony to the tenacity and the persistence and the focus of the GM employees to look through the dark days of the bankruptcy, the days leading up to the bankruptcy, and kept focused to deliver great products. There was a lot of turmoil around the company, around the industry, and it was most impressive, and it is the source of inspiration to me personally, and it's a privilege as much as anything to lead such a great team of people that are so committed to doing what's right for their company and, in a sense, for their country. In many ways, what it comes down to in the future to get people like you, and I view everyone in this room as a potential GM customer. That's why I'm here today. <laughs> But we have to rebuild the trust in the General Motors product line. And it took many years of really not listening to our customer base and arguably poor quality to destroy what which once was a great image. Well, I will tell you today that our quality is second to none. There's no foreign transplant. There's no foreign competitor that produces cars any better than we do. These are world-class cars. That's been verified not only from internal but external metrics. So I'm proud to be a team leader of a great company with great products. And I hope you will reconsider or consider your next purchase, four of which will be upstairs following the meeting. <laughs> GM is a company, and as we went through the IPO and we knew we were going to have a special offering, Everything from the press release, and I hope you saw in our public statements, the, the humility we wanted to project. We survived a near-death experience, and we deeply appreciate uh, the support we got from the American people on a state and federal level, and we will not forget that. For the first time in a generation, and I am not kidding, 
This was a company that had many structural cost problems. Post-retirement health care, job banks, it just goes, the list goes on and on. That has all been rectified. In fact, for the first time, we have a level playing field. So as we said in one of our earlier lines, advertising lines, may the best car win. And if that's the metric by which we are measured, I am confident of our future. So we look forward to re-earning the public's trust and respect every day. We look forward to a bright future. And with that, David, I'd like to turn it back to you because I know you want to ask me a lot of questions. But So I understand you drove over in a vault today. So just between us, what was it like? Ecstasy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I've only had my life threatened twice so far. So I actually have security now, which is something new for me. I uh, always felt secure with you, though, David. Right. Uh, <laughs> I had, he drove the car, because usually I drive in a oh. SUV, but I wanted to drive the car here in case anybody wanted to take us up in the $25 around the block. <laughs> but uh, he was impressed. I mean, this guy drives professionally, and he was, uh, it's tight, it's got, I mean, it's just not the propulsion system. What does it look like? I know I'm gonna offend a lot of you, uh, Toyota, but we commonly refer to the Geekmobile as the Prius. I mean, I wouldn't be caught dead in a Prius, <laughs> but uh, this actually looks good, and uh, I've driven at 500 miles. My wife's here. She'll test to it. We've, uh, we've used 1.2 gallons of gas. Really? Yeah. So 80% and, and of the people in America drive 40 miles or less per day. 40 miles or per, less per day. So you should be able to drive the average per 80% of us should be able to drive without ever... Like if I work in a car lot right. down 10 miles back home, I'd so be able to it's, fill a, it up. it's going to be for sale as of what two weeks from now, or we already got 200,000 orders. So uh, now a lot of people that when they show up may not want to fork over that much money. Um, you know, this is another thing about the Volt, and, and, and there aren't going to be that many available this year. Probably 20, 25,000 nationally. Um, we liquid cool the battery pack. The battery pack weighs 400 pounds. And many of the battery electric vehicles will be air-cooled. And we are forefront in the tech now. We spend $7 billion a year in research and development. We're a true repository of, of technology. We put another $7 billion in engineering. And the air-cooled battery pack is estimated to last three to five years. That's a $15,000 replacement uh, cost. Right. So we've guaranteed the battery pack on the Volt for eight years or 100,000 miles. So we know the residual of this car will be good at the end of three years, the total cost of a car over a three-year period. And uh, when we come out with a battery electric, that could be, um, that could be a problem to residuals. Okay. This would be something to be factored into the economics. So when you are here, whenever you are on the weekends, what car are you driving? I'm driving the Volt right Volt. now. Um, Wait till you see the new Camaro coming out. I know this sounds like an advertisement, but it, <laughs> the new Camaro uh, convertible. Uh, you're going to love that car, too. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a great seller, but we're going to put it in a soft top starting January. So Get why, that this summer. why exactly did you walk away from a lot of money um, <laughs> that would have helped your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren um, what was really the motivation, uh, if you could articulate that? Well, I know, and uh, I was asked that question uh, last week when we rolled out the Volt <clears throat> by uh, a Fox reporter. I doubt if they showed this on television, but he said, he was quoting you. I, if, I think you've said this in several forums. <laughs> in fact, I know you told Larry Summers because he, he, uh, he, he mentioned the specific number. Well, I, I, when he, was, he was staggered when I told it to him. Are you recruiting him to... Uh, anyway... Uh, Today's his last day on the job, but... Uh, 
I know. Um, there's more to life than money. I wasn't put on this earth to just make money. I, I can't tell you, uh, in my lifetime, there have been iconic events. When I got married, my children, my grandchildren. When I, when you, when I walked on the trading floor, once the deal was done, there were hundred there were people, there must have been 400 people, and they just stood up and they clapped. Uh, one of the traders on the floor told me, when they had to delist General Motors, he cried. And when they relisted General Motors, he cried. And when I went back to Detroit, there, were, there was an employee meeting of 2,000 people. And there was a man my age, and he cried. And he said, 18 months ago, I thought this company was gone. My house was gone. So it's hard to describe. Um, and it was in those experiences, no offense to Carlisle, it is a wonderful place. It's a wonderful, it's a great people. But I know I made the right decision. Well. Because this company, quite frankly, is too important to fail. The American industrial infrastructure is too important to let go down. And I will tell you, the implications here, and I'll leave it to other people to argue about it, had General Motors gone down, we spend $80 billion a year in our supply chain. Ford wasn't in that good a shape two years ago, and I'm not going to say they would have gone down, but if our supply chain would have gone down, I think that would have caused huge disruptions for everybody. And I don't know what the cost would have been of another million people unemployed in this country, but it would have been a lot more than um, <clears throat> a lot of people have projected, in my opinion. So sometimes you have to do what has to be done. And I'm not that special, but someone had to stand up. Well, um, Dan, when you did the IPO and you went around the world, what were the... Uh the impressions that you got around the world. What, what, you, what do you think made the stock sell so, so well, really? You were originally going to price it at the, I think, in the mid-20s or so. 26 to 29. And it priced at $33. So obviously, it was great demand, and you increased the, uh, the offering size. So what were you, would you say the one or two main factors that propelled the interest? Well, um, the fact that we have a great um, contract with the union and the uh, substance and form of um, a competitive cost structure here in North America. But what's, what really, I thought, intrigued and, and surprised me when I went on the board in 09, July of 09, was the market position. We will produce almost as many cars in China this year as we will in the United States. And we are continually gain, gaining market share. We have um, a most enviable position in China. And when we talked about our plans, for example, you all, we all live here. And believe me, um, uh, you, if you think about this, we don't as Americans because we view it as kind of a homogeneous country. It's not. When I was at MCI, for example, we would not run the same ads in Birmingham, Alabama as we would in Brooklyn. Joan Rivers didn't sell well in Birmingham. And um, <clears throat> so there are different regions, as you think about it. I mean, California is kind of a right. culture of its own, and, and uh, so is Alabama, and so is Minnesota. So is China. We, we look at China in four different ways. Big cities, Shanghai, Beijing, Hong Kong, and then we look at the... But if you look out in the western provinces, we're going to produce a new car called Baojun this year. And... Um, it wouldn't sell in, in any industrial market because we've got to sell it for down in the $5,000 range. And you can imagine, for example, easy, it doesn't have electric windows. You have uh, roll windows. I, that's, that would freak all of us out. Uh, it might hurt my wrist. Uh, but anyway, so you, you, we, we, we not only sell up market, but we're going to sell down market. Chevrolet is, a, is our global brand. I will tell you, I looked at a Chevrolet. Uh, I was at our design and tech center the other day. We have a new Chevrolet that's going to come out. Uh, if you looked at it, it looks like a BMW, only it's American, and it costs half as much. 
And when we asked in a blind, we, we stacked all the cars in that sector up against the Chevrolet. And this is, we were right in the middle from a price point. And we asked people to take those same cars. They drove them all. They didn't know who made them. They put that car that they didn't know was a Chevrolet here, BMW here. I mean, this went right down the line. This car, uh, there are new cars coming, new uh, models uh, that will, I think, uh, stand us in very good stead. Well, now, you repaid, uh, I guess, a total of about $32 billion has been repaid to the federal government, 23 from the IPO and some earlier. How much money does the government uh, have to get back to be break even, and what stock price would they have to sell the remaining shares in order to, quote, break even? Well, they own 61% of the company before. They own 33%. On a basic basis, on a fully diluted, they own 27. I just happen to know these numbers. Right. <laughs> so they own a third of the company, so 500 million shares at about uh, $33 a share, multiply 500 times 33. That's what they need to get out to break. Uh, that'll, that'll mean that somewhere in the high 40s, low 50s, the, the previous break even was around $41, $42 a share, I think. We sold for 33, and that's about where it is today. So. Um, do you give any advice to the government about when they should sell the remaining shares? And does the government give you any advice about how to operate the company? No and no. We, uh, it's a very uh, clear and bright line, and the administration has been great about this. They don't involve themselves in the boardroom or the management or the operation of the company. They, we had a shareholder meeting this summer. It was funny. There were four people there. Uh, the U.S. government, the Canadian government, the uh, uh, Health Trust for the Union, and um, Motors Liquidation Corporation representing the bondholders in large measure. If they don't like what the board's doing, they, should, they would remove them or parts of them. Uh, it wasn't, it's not our business, not our call. If you had a million shares, and only David would have a million shares of a particular stock, if your financial advisor, you said you wanted to sell, you wouldn't want the advisor saying, well, I'll tell you when you're going to sell and how much you're going to sell. It's not our role to tell the federal government anything. They, they are an owner, and they determined how much they wanted to sell and when they want to sell it. But they still can determine pay um, salaries and so forth at General Motors. Is that still appropriate? Is that still, that's still true. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nice. So we go on to the next question. Well, you know, um, in fact, I'm visiting with this special paymaster this afternoon. And uh, not about me. I mean, uh, we have to be competitive, and we have to be able to uh, attract and retain great people. And we've been able to do that, but I think it's largely out of a, a commitment, which may sound strange, it, it money isn't everything. It, people, we've been able to attract pretty damn good people, in my opinion, and we've been able to retain people, but we're starting to lose them now. And, um, and I think that's an issue for our shareholder, our owners to recognize that in their best interest, we should get some relaxation. Now, when you were asked to join the General Motors board, you were a member of the board before you became the CEO. Um, one, did the government know that you were a Republican? Did they care? And secondly, what, did you, uh, what impressions did you take away from the General Motors company when you joined the board? What was the biggest shock that you found when you joined the board? Did you plant this, David? Well, uh, I would describe myself, and I say this with some pride, as a Colin Powell Republican. Uh, Aren't many of them left, I guess. <laughs> well, there are at least two, and it sounds like there are more. Um, yes, they did. Well, you have to. Uh, I know John McCainy happened to go to the Naval Academy, and uh, I consider him a friend, so I supported him. Yes, I've re I've supported Democrats as well. I I like to think that people that are right thinking, not right of center, but right thinking, should be in our Congress, and in our in our political community. Um, so I don't think that made a difference to him. When you joined the board, uh, what, what were your biggest impressions of the, of the company? When you joined, uh, you had not been on their board before and wasn't that, weren't that familiar with the company. What was the biggest surprise or shock that you had? On the board? 
when you joined the board? Um, well, I, I think that too often too many things were done intuitively. And where we, Carlisle, you do, I thought, insightful, probing, financial analyses. Uh, there was one report, uh, a couple of us got upset when they brought up the request for it. I mean, the, the numbers we're talking about here are, are really large. I mean, uh, we do 10 and $12 billion in sales a month. Uh, our capital budgets are huge, and the development of a new eco engine was in excess of a billion dollars, and it was basically, we need it. And uh, as you know, and most of you in business would say, well, do you make it or do you buy it? Can I get it from somewhere else? Little known fact, how many of you all drive BMWs? That car with that great engineering. Well, you'd be pleased to know that GM makes your transmission. That German engineering is uh, <laughs> made in Detroit. Uh, but uh, do you have to make everything? And that was kind of anathema to the GM um, culture was, it's the GM way. And culturally, uh, I would say, uh, that has to change over time. The sooner the better, but it won't probably be overnight. How are your labor costs now, are they roughly the same as uh, BMW or Toyota in the United States? When you produce a car now, are your labor per hourly costs roughly the same? Yes. They are the same. Okay. Now, some of your predecessors, uh, Rick Wagner, Fritz Henderson, have you talked with them about what mistakes they think they might have made or what advice they would give to you? And what have you done to kind of get some of the institutional memory? Well, yes, I have. Um, I thought um, they're all fine gentlemen, and uh, I was, I don't know if I was criticized as much as it was observed, I'm not a car guy. Um, in some respects, I think maybe a fresh perspective in someone who's been in other industries, seen other uh, issues, and. As you know, we used to look at a lot of turnarounds and recapitalization. So I'm not sure I was totally witless, but uh, I think uh, institutional knowledge is important. I still meet with uh, a subset of the prior management on a routine basis just to see. I, I want to know what others think. I don't necessarily have to accept it, but I want to know what outside informed auto uh, executives, tenured auto executives, think about what we're doing. Um, and some of it's very insightful for me, but the more points of view I get, I think the better able I make to make better decisions. So yes, I've uh, gone to their homes. Okay. I've uh, played Jeopardy with them on occasion, not literally, but from an auto perspective. And I think I've been the beneficiary of their knowledge. Today, what would you say your two or three biggest challenges are as the, as the CEO of General Motors? What do you, what do you stay up at night worrying about the most? Well, as I tell everybody, I worry about everything. And uh, it was funny when I was on the uh, floor of the, uh, I mean, we just ran like dogs for weeks. And uh, one of these reporters told me I look like hell. And I said, thanks. That was just before the t camera went on. That was it. <laughs> then I saw him in, uh, in Detroit when we rolled out the vault, and he says, you look better, but you don't look that great. Uh, my wife told me I did, though. And um, well, I worry about the culture. I worry about our cost position going forward, for example. And I, and I, and, and I think management has to, be, has to have integrity. And I don't mean that we don't have integrity, but for example, we just, I just put out a memo to all of North America, there'll be no salary increases this year. We are gonna put a small contingency to the side, so if we see issues where we're not competitive, we can address it. Because the structural cost of a two or 3% increase, after five years, I got 15% structural cost increase. I can't have that. In a company that's in a very cyclical industry, I mean, it's unbelievable how, how predictably cyclical this industry is over the last 100 years. About every three to five, seven years, up, down, up, down. And going back to the Carlisle days, I see the great Carlisle investors here. We used, when, before the Great Recession, we actually 
and intellectualized and said, let's buy more defensive industries that will be impacted, but not as severely. And in an up market, you look for cyclical companies. And this is a cyclical company, and I don't get the, the opportunity to be a portfolio manager anymore. You have to, we're betting on a cyclical industry. That's why I want a zero debt balance sheet. So we can invest without canceling and getting a ratcheting in our capital programs. So we had $26 billion in debt before the bankruptcy. We have less than $4 billion in debt today. We had a $26 billion pension liability and I came in, it's $10 billion today. We have $28 billion of cash on the balance sheet and we are looking at that pension, unfunded pension liability now. But we have to have a robust fortress balance sheet. That sounds funny, I mean people look at me like I'm from Mars now coming from a private equity firm where we typically bought predictable cash flows, again, predictable cash flows, and then and had debt, and we would pay the debt down. This is a different game. We're playing football, not rugby. It's kind of the same thing, but it's different. And you have to shape the business model and intellectualize the problem much more than maybe it was done before. So, if you look across, this cost structure and structural costs will kill you. I want, we're going to have incentive pay, variable pay for management in the near term. And so when I, I meet with the union every four to six weeks, I know that may sound strange to some of my former business friends. Uh, I was taken... I actually had the, the head of the UAW and the head of the uh, GM vice president on the balcony at the um, IPO. I've invited them to board dinners. I've invited them to that employee meeting I referenced before and had them introduced. They are our business partners. I don't want a contentious relationship with the union. I want them to be our business partner. So I, I've broached in these meetings I have with them that they have to, because you heard a lot of noise in the uh, public forum about, aren't you guys going to go back hard at management? Aren't you going to get every dime back that you had to give up in the, um, in the bankruptcy? And their prosperity is tied to, tied to the company's prosperity. They happen to have a, a representative between me and the average employee. But I've tried to breach that. And I mean, I go, I go to a plant a month, and I'll tell you, it's, it's like, it's so invigorating and affirming to walk through the plant, people yelling at you, hey, Dan. I mean, because they, they, you know, you can't be trusted without giving trust, and you can't have credibility, because the immediate response was, well, I, I want you guys to think about this. He says, I've heard that from CEOs of GM, and then they go and give management a three to 5% raise. So I put it out on our website that essentially there are no increases in base pay this year. And because and, I don't think we can do that if we don't lead by example. So you have to have the culture issue isn't some amorphous thing. It's, it's about me. It's about the management team. It's about our relationship with the union. Can we be trusted? Um, I think we've got to invest. Uh, when I talk about product, are we going to have the right products? What do we want to be? What do we want to be remembered? I mean, uh, I got, of course, I, I'm, I'm probably a little thin-skinned having worked in private equity. I'm not as tough as I used to be. <laughs> I know some of you out there I used to work with probably don't believe that. But I mean, I don't like, um, it was important that we have uh, credibility in what we do. And it, it extends into our, into our products. So what do, what do we want to be remembered as? And for example, when I look back to the dumb things that management did coming out of post-World War II, we had a, an oligopoly. We, we had 50%. In fact, people bitch about the, the uh, complaint about, the, <laughs> about government involvement in, in General Motors. In 1960, they were talking, well, they have too much market share. We ought to break them up. Well, were they involved in the company then? Of course they were. So now they're just involved in the company from another perspective. But um, it's, what, what, how do we want the company to be remembered? So when you go back and you look at um, 1960 
and they were giving away post-retirement health care, which was just corrosive to the cost structure, the structural cost of the company. And they gave these job banks in perpetuity. It just was such a burden on the company that made us non-competitive. And you say, well, who did that? Well, they did it because there was no competition after the war out of uh, Europe, because it was bombed out, and so was Asia. We were roaming the, the globe uh, on a trade perspective, and these guys just wanted to buy uh, peace. So Ford would agree with the, the labor contract that GM or Chrysler negotiated, because as long as they didn't get competitive advantage. So they underestimated foreign competition, foreign quality, and they were arrogant. So, I mean, I, I, I've had people come to me and say, well, uh, what about a labor agreement till 2020, 2025? I don't want to burden my successor with that type of decision. When you're a successor, you're not leaving, I know, but you're committed to do this for five years or so, would you say? Yeah, but I mean, you, the reason I wanted, this is a criticism, thin-skinned, I guess, why did I want the Chinese in this investment? Because if someone looks back in 2050 to 2010 and says, who was a fool run into place then, and, he's, and I pass an opportunity not only to have a leading market share and a dynamic position in China, but I also tied up with a, the number one manufacturer in China from an economics point of view. And I've been to China, I've met with the senior management of the Shanghai Auto, this is a great partnership, and I think to be tied, and we went in with them 50-50 into India, this is one in three people on the earth live in two countries, India and China. We would be fools to pass this up. And so instead of making and, and committing the company to, I think, a bad uh, strategy is to, you know, so they put a half billion dollars into us. I know it sounds like a lot of money, but it's not that much in the grand scheme of things, that I want that tie into China, I want that tie into Asia, and, and I think in some respects, it wouldn't be all bad if we were considered global motors and not general motors. Well, if, um, what percentage of your stock you think is held by people outside the United States now? About 8%. 8%. 8%. Yeah. And today, your market share in the United States is roughly what? Well, this is good news. Last, uh, last year, we were, at this time, we were 17 and a half. I think we're up to 19. 19. And then your market share in China is what? Almost 13, 14%. But that 13% is almost as many cars as you're selling right. in the United States. Yeah, we'll right? make as many cars in China this year, well, almost as many in China as we do in the United States. It's been a dramatic. Has, has anybody from the government called to thank you for getting $23 billion back in the uh, coffers of the Treasury? Well, remember, not all of it went to the federal government. The, the, the Canadians got a little bit. Uh, I, I'm not doing that. They, they, they own a reasonably small amount. But um, yes. Were they effusive or just uh, <laughs> polite? You know, David, I, I thought you were more effusive here today right, than okay. you ever were when I was at Carlisle. So I, I suppose when I'm gone, they might be effusive, okay. but they aren't now. So um, I, got I got a job to do, and not to be. Okay. Well, let me ask you uh, one last question before we have a couple from the audience. Uh, what advice? What was the best advice that somebody gave you when you became the, the CEO? Did somebody? a business colleague or somebody give you some advice, what was the best advice you got? Uh, probably not to take myself too seriously. Uh, it, this, this job, if you, uh, I mean, look at this. If I showed up here last year, probably would have filled that table. Uh, it, it is uh, overwhelming, the public exposure you get in this uh, position. I was surprised at that. And, and I think it is, don't take yourself too seriously. Okay, we have time for some questions uh, right here. One, speak up. If you don't have a mic, just speak up loudly. It used to be a status symbol to drive a GM car, not a German car. Uh, so listening to you, I hope that um, those days will come back again and uh, driving a GM car uh, will make us all proud uh, outside the U.S. But my question for you is, about six months ago at uh, All Things D, um, the CEO of Ford, uh, talked about uh, the sink and uh, how they're introducing uh, all this new technology to help the driver in the car. Do you think that that's a differentiator um, or is it uh, really building a solid car, a good cost structure? 
I think first and foremost, you have to deliver core value in the, um, in the basic uh, value proposition. Good car, it's reliable, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's got great quality, and it's durable. And that's why we've made huge progress. The average um, uh, residual, what is the car worth after three and five years at, at GM has increased anywhere from five to nine basis, uh, 500 to 900 basis points in the last year. So we're comparable with our competition. So get to your uh, 1970s Lebanon story. Uh, we will get there. Now we have to show that we're consistent. I mean, you know, one, you can't be a good one year or two years. You've got to do it over five or 10 or 15 years. Um, as it relates, OnStar, when I got there, and uh, it hasn't morphed yet, but uh, I just hired a Nextel, one of the senior Nextel people to go into that OnStar. Uh, it was kind of a uh, safety and security. As I described, I went down, I, the people were crushed. I went down there and I says, this is, uh, I've fallen and I can't get up. Automotive's equivalent. I says, we've got so much potential. Sync is contained within the car. There's no external updates. I mean, believe it or not, if you're driving a GM car with OnStar on it, I can tell what your oil pressure is, your transmission fluid, your air in your car, your tires. Uh, I, have a, I, have a, uh, I had a Mercedes <laughs> before I took this job, and I always got a, tire, a low tire. I didn't, they wouldn't tell me what tire it was. So I pull up, and I got to fill all four of them up and get out there, and it was cold. Boy, by the way, isn't it warm here? <laughs> I, I, I got up this morning, it was 32 degrees. I, left, uh, did, I got up yesterday morning, it was 11. Uh, <laughs> a little aside. But it, uh, it, um, what we're going to do uh, with OnStar, and you saw it, social media, we just loaded into it. We, we don't want to create bad habits with distracted driving. I just met with the Secretary of Transportation last week on this subject. So we're, we're going to, you'll be able, texting, you'll be, it'll be uh, digitized and downloaded to you. For every GM car, you have a unique phone number attached to it. I didn't know that before I was at GM. So if your spouse or someone is running errands and you say, well, how can I get a hold of her and she never turns on her cell phone car, and, uh, <laughs> I could call a car and it would digit download to her. I could text her, it would verbalize to her. And then I don't want her texting. So we're going to try to conform four or five basic questions so she can say yes, no, or he can say yes, no, I can't talk now, I'll, I'll call you later. So we're, we're working on that. We're working with consumer groups so, or focus groups so we can uh, bring uh, without distracting. That right now, for example, we were driving out to Annapolis and it was what restaurant do we go to? Well, as you know, if you have a GPS, you can't, while well, the car's moving, you can't punch it in for safety reasons. Well, all you gotta do is hit your OnStar button, and say, I wanna go to, act, uh, to such and such restaurant in Annapolis, and she'll say, I'll download it to you, and it's down there right like that. This is gonna, that interactivity with a database outside the automo, uh, automobile is it gonna be a, dis, uh, a dis, distinction and a differentiator versus sync, and I think people will look at our cars are generally all five-star rated from a safety perspective. We're going to start talking about safety because I don't want to say quality is a commodity, but quality in terms of the way we do supply chain all around the world. We've gone to global architectures and global platforms, so a car that we build in Germany or we build in China or we build in the United States is basically off the same supply chain. So we test like no one's ever, and so do our competitors. So the quality of cars has, re has risen dramatically. So how do I differentiate? Styling. I mean, I think I take an active interest in all of our commercials, and some of them you've seen. I, I look at every one of them. I want to look at every design of every car. I want to, there are certain things a CEO should do, and there are certain things you should stay the hell out of. Uh, but the safety and telematics are differentiators in my mind, and I think we should... Uh, Dan, uh, in advertising, you mentioned that uh, your predecessor was on TV all the time with ads. Yeah. Are we going to see you on TV with any ads, or you're not sure yet? No, they'll never see me on television. Um, but I want you, I, I'll tell you, uh, going to something I said before, I, I want to have a hand in them. And I don't know how many over Thanksgiving you saw the falling down ad. Did anybody see those ads? We all fall down. 
you know, it, it, uh, that was a big risk for us because it just reinforced the bankruptcy. But you know, everybody has troubles in their life. <clears throat> we had trouble as a company, as a family. And um, to say we, we, we made mistakes, we failed, and uh, that we appreciated it, and we wanted to say thank you. I got letters and emails and says, you know, the, A, I like this, you're humble. And we should be humble. We, we did fail. Um, but you said thank you. Why didn't the bank say thank you? Why didn't AIG, who got $150 billion, say thank you? And just a, just a thank you. I, and that ad could only run for a week, the one week after the IPO. And uh, we can't do it again. So, no, I will not be, but I am going to be very involved, right. very interested. Another percent time sense. for another question. Brother, anybody else? One more, last question. Can I ask you a, a question about cor corporate culture? GM for years was known the GM way, or something mm. probably I think you're saying now wasn't so good. You knew for a long time you had more brands than you could sustain, you had safety, you had quality issues. Was the near-death experience of bankruptcy enough to shake up the corporate culture at the mid-level manager issue and to get to get over some of the issues you think you need to? I doubt it. Um, I talked to all the employees and I said the good news we were in bankruptcy 39 days I don't think we did irreparable damage to the uh, brands the bad news we were in bankruptcy only 39 days and there's there's I will say this I, I there is an element in a, a segment of the population that views it as a bad storm that passed and so we have to change for example we went from 48 models I like this I, I keep You'd love this in my office. I, I keep a, the front page, uh, the cover of Fortune magazine from the mid-'80s, and they had Oldsmobile, Pontiac, Chevrolet, and Buick, and they were exactly the same. I meet routinely with the head of Cadillac, GMC, Buick, uh, and um, Chevrolet, because uh, I want brand identity. I want brand attributes. I want brand equity. And now what we have, what I call swim lanes. So I, when, when you're trying, to, when your cars look exactly the same, and my dad always, we always had GM cars. And when we were not doing so well, we had Pontiacs and things went better. We got a Oldsmobile, and then you went to Buick and you said, what the hell, what's, and I always wonder, well, what's the difference that's a GM car? GM is not a brand, it's a holding company. Chevrolet's a brand, Buick's a brand, GMC's a brand, Cadillac's a brand. So now we have these swim lanes that are broad enough that we can talk about brand attributes associated with styling, exciting, youth, reliable, value. That's the Chevy. Understated elegance is the Buick. And I want the Buick to flank the, the premium brand. So we have clear, before they were too closely bunched. And um, we, we have to um, really intellectualize the marketing. And then, I mean, getting to your point, you say, well, I says, how many engine types do we have? We have 18 engine types, 18 engine types. And maybe I'm not a car guy, but I was an engineer once. And you say, well, what's the difference, <laughs> what's the difference between a 1.4 and a 1.5 liter engine? Because a guy says one-tenth of a liter. And I, says, <laughs> and I say, yeah, I, I know, but why, why do we have 18 dedicated to 1.4 and 1.5? And, and, and then there, we have what are called variants, whether it's uh, turbo, gas, diesel, so I have a 1.4 in gas, diesel, uh, turbo, and you go, my God, we, we've made it too complex. So we now have a plan to go from 18 down to eight or nine. And um, we have a, we had a plan, uh, I shouldn't say, I'll, I know there are reporters in the crowd. Um, you know, what do we do if oil goes to $100 a barrel? What do we do? We weren't ready, or $200 a barrel. Uh, the last time oil went to $140 a barrel, we were largely SUV crossover driven, and we didn't. Ha now we've got uh, what we call a T300, which you'll see out, which is going to be another great small car. Uh, you've got the uh, Cruise, which is, I think, going to be a grand slam home run, and we're going to come up with an eco uh, engine on that. And you've got the Volt, and we're, the lineup is pretty impressive over the next couple of years. So you say to yourself, well, um, what do we do? Well, right now, uh, we've got to start, it takes years to turn this ship around. And you say, well, what do we do if it's 120 next year? That's the question before the executive committee. 
I obviously have a strong point of view on that, and I don't want to influence it as an outcome, but as a team, I'm trying to get people to come to the right conclusion, and I think we do have a, a plan that's not final form, but it's pretty getting pretty firm on how do we uh, reposition the company for good times, mid-cycle, up-cycle. But what if we have an up-cycle and, and oil goes to 120 or $30 a barrel? What do we do? And it's going to boil down to not so much um, design and style the top hat, as I call it, of the car, but what, how do we drive the propulsion systems? Propulsion is a key investment. We're spending billions of dollars. We have hydrogen cars that are really cool. I mean, I'm a real pain in the rear sometimes. I says, well, if it's that clean, let me put my face down by the muffler, by the exhaust. And I did. You know, the guy's looking at me like, oh, good. <laughs> and uh, so I'm down there. And I, it, there's, it's water. It's, it's just water coming out. I mean, uh, but the car cost $500,000. <laughs> Because it, 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 in the chemistry of the engine, you got a lot of platinum. Well, platinum is like, it's more expensive than gold. And so the, the actual chemistry has to be worked out before we can develop these new propulsion systems. But electrification of the car is critical. And I talked about extended range electric vehicle, the battery electric vehicles. We've got plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. We're going to have a family of them, and we want them in every one of our uh, models. We don't want the Cadillac to be left we're going to have electrification. For example, the Buick LaCrosse, which is, I think, the finest automobile for its money. We're killing Lexus. We're killing Acura on these things. And you say to yourself, we get 26 miles the gallon on the road. Well, that's OK today. So we're going to put what's called a Bass Plus, a battery alternator starter on it. It'll jump it to 37, 36 miles a gallon. Gee whiz, a midsize sedan making that kind of mileage is good. But it's not good enough, because the government's looking at 60 plus miles per gallon in 2025. How do we achieve that across the portfolio? So I mean, you can't, you can't Bill McGowan, who was the founder of MCI, was one of the best, biggest men in my life and a great uh, mentor for me. But I mean, he told me when, I, when he made me president of MCI, he says, Dan, don't try to look into the future. Imagine yourself five years, and where do you want this company to be, and how do I, how do I get there? Well, this company takes so much investment and, and development is in three and four and five year increments. I can't think out five years. You gotta look out, well, what are we gonna do in 2025? Because if the, some of the prior management had thought out 20 years and 25 years. I don't think they would have made the decisions they made in 1960 that really, in a sense, sealed the fate of my immediate pre predecessors. Uh, they were good guys, uh, capable, smart, and had, uh, they were the victims of structural costs that were uh, engaged or committed to in the 60s and 70s. Dan, um I hope it was water coming out of the exhaust pipe. <laughs> and um, I wanted to thank you on behalf of the Economic Club of Washington for a terrific presentation. It's clear why you took the job. Let me give you a gift. Hold on. Thank you. It's a uh, map of the District of Columbia. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank, thank you, you very much, Dan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, David. Great job. Great. Thanks a lot.